Clara, who came all the way from Somerville. So that's why she hit a bit, a bit of traffic. Um, sometimes people coming from the other side of Walpole hit just as much traffic. Very silly. <laughs> it is, it is. So Lara is here, uh, Lara Cazo from Mass Audubon. She is the adult education coordinator for the Metro South region, and she's here to talk about nature in your neighborhood. And it looks like the weather is cooperating to take a little walk outside after. So hopefully um, some of you will be able to join her. I'm going to pass this over to Lara. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Sorry about the technical difficulties. I feel like those always happen, but we're here now and I'm excited to meet you all. Um, so as was mentioned, my name is Lara Cazo. I am the Mass Audubon edu uh, Adult Education Coordinator and Teacher Naturalist. Basically, that means that I come out, meet with adults and do education on all sorts of different topics. Um, birds, wildlife, climate change, all sorts of different programs along with art programs that we do out of Canton at the Museum of American Bird Art. And I'll talk a little bit about the programs that we're doing then. But for my background, I have an undergraduate degree from the University of Rhode Island in wildlife biology and a master's in ornithology. So I study birds. <laughs> but we're going to talk a little bit more than birds today. We're going to talk about mammals and we're going to talk about uh, animals that you can see right out your window or just have to go a little bit further to find them, but that are all in these urban spaces. So we're gonna talk a little bit about wildlife all around us, considerations for urban wildlife, ID skills, how you guys can learn to ID some of the animals that you might not know that come to the feeder or that you see outside, and some things you could do um, in your neighborhood to support local wildlife. So this Nature in Your Neighborhood talk was brought to you by your local cultural council. Um, we received a donation for them to come to towns like yours to give this talk. So if you guys have questions as we go through, um, comments, anything, please feel free to share them. We're all adults here. You can just, we don't have to wait to the end if you want. We can have more discussion um, if that's what you're into. So just let me know if you have questions as we go forward. Does anyone have one now? No, okay. Okay, so to start with, a lot of people don't think of wildlife when they think of cities and urban spaces, but wildlife is everywhere. I mean, we all know make way for ducklings happened right here in Boston. I was at the commons the other day and it's, it's a very urban space. There's lots of traffic, there's lots of buildings, but there's a ton of wildlife right there in the small commons. One of the other big places to see wildlife is actually, um, New York city. Mm. Why am I blanking on the park in New York City? Central Park <laughs> is a huge spot for wildlife in this big urban and area. They are there. And there's a lot of books and media that talks about wildlife in urban spaces. Um, I grew up with If You Give a Moose a Muffin as a book my mom read to me as a kid. The new one for the kids is Don't Let the Pigeon Drive the Bus. My godson really likes that one. Um, and of course, the comic Over the Hedge really talks about these wild animals living in urban spaces. So we might not think about it when we naturally think of wildlife, but it is there. And we do have like a lot of our media and a lot of our stories do talk about it, but we forget about it a lot of the time. Or when we do think about it, we think about these guys. We think about deer, we think about raccoons, our little trash pandas, we think about pigeons, or we think, you know, just of, you know, some mallards or very common animals that you that you expect to see which is very true these guys are probably the most likely that you're going to see in urban spaces but they're not the only ones for example snowy owls love logan airport they love logan airport in the winter looks like a tundra especially when it snows mass audubon actually um one of our directors norman he his job now he's retired, but he goes out and catches the snowy owls um, out of the Logan airport so that he can put them somewhere else so that they don't get hit by a plane and so they don't hit a plane and, you know, rip that up. Birds are a huge problem for planes, guys. Um, but they're there. These big, beautiful owls will hang out at the airport. You wouldn't expect that. This moose was seen in Marlboro not too long ago. Just kind of 
walking through everyone's driveways. And here in Wapple, there was a black bear not that long ago. Um, I think this was caught on like one of those door cameras, just like walking through the streets, looking around. I don't know how many of you have seen a black bear, but it's pretty cool that they're there. And also in Boston, there's a ton of bald eagles. People don't often see bald eagles, but that's because you're not looking. They're everywhere. Anywhere that there's a waterway, if you're, you know, a, a river, if you're in Boston where there's a bay, bald eagles eat fish. So there's tons of nesting bald eagles here, especially in the early spring. I think there's something like 51 confirmed breeding pairs in the area, like in around Boston. That's a lot of bald eagles. And I see these guys sometimes when I'm driving on 93. I didn't see one today. I was busy stuck in traffic, but I see them sometimes just flying overhead. So you can see bald eagles pretty frequently if you are paying attention and know where to look. On top of that, this is a um, leatherback sea turtle that was found in Quincy, injured, took to a rehab, and then re-released. So there are, even though we have very urban spaces, there are some really cool animals that we can see um, and experience if we just know a little bit where to look. So that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about today. And I'm also going to talk about why some of these animals are seen more in urban spaces and why some aren't. This is a uh, percentage of population globally. Um, with the darker red areas being higher population um, and blue being very, very, very low population, almost none. And if we, we look at this, we can see, you know, the East Coast of America is like very, very populated. We can see Europe, extremely populated, India and so on. And then if we zoom in just to the United States and we look at Boston right here, we are very dark red for, for population um, per square mile. So there is over um, 5,000 people for, per square mile in Massachusetts. That is a ton of, ton of, ton of people. Um, so we are a very dense urban area, even though sometimes it doesn't feel like it. You know, when I drive out here and you see like blue hills and stuff, you're like, we're in the woods. Well, <laughs> kind of. Um, but there's, there's still a lot of people in this area. That being said, there's also a ton of wildlife. So I kind of skipped this here. Here is just the outline of Boston alone, according to Google Maps. So this is the zip code of Boston, Massachusetts. Somerville and Cambridge are not highlighted here, um, but we, we can go down. Here's Quincy, Newton, Waltham, but we're specifically looking in the highlighted Boston region. And every single one of the points on this map is a different observation of a species. So just in Boston alone, there has been over 92,000 observations collected and over 4,000 species seen just in this region just in the Boston mapped area. That's a lot of species. And they are not just pigeons and raccoons and white-tailed deer. There's a ton of different types of species that are in this area. We just gotta figure out where they are and why they're here. Breaking it down a little further, we can, if we're looking specifically at Boston, there's over 4,000 species of plants and trees. That one makes sense. There's um, almost 2,000 type species of animal, 250 bird species, 36 mammal species, and 26 amphibian and reptile species seen in Boston. And this is just collected data. There's probably more, but this is just Boston alone. That's a ton. Seeing all 250 birds could take a really long time if you have the dedication, but they can be seen in Boston. This is... Um, Milton, um, where the Blue Hills are, and obviously a much smaller region than the Boston region, but they have over 2,000 observations as well, just collected here. I think a lot of this is because of the uh, Blue Hill Reservation, because people go there, they want to like collect data and so on, but this is also just a ton of species in this relatively um, urbanized area that people are seeing. Now, 
how is this data collected um, and how could you use the data? I want to talk about that briefly. So we're going to, you know, pause, talk about this real quick, and then come back to the main lecture because I like to show everybody um, the website iNaturalist where I collect this data. Please excuse all my, oh, you can't even see it. So good. You don't, you don't get to see the weird tabs I had open Googling snails last night. In case you're wondering what a wildlife biologist does in her free time. But iNaturalist is a really handy website for people who are interested in seeing wildlife where they are, or even if you're interested in traveling. So I like to share this website with everybody. So if you're curious about going to see animals or if there's something you really want to see, this is a really helpful website. So it's called iNaturalist and the page looks like this. And we are just going to go to explore. And this is citizen science collected data. I'm going to look at the map. So this is people like you. These are college students. These are not, some of them are dedicated researchers, but a lot of this is just citizen science collected data. And all over the globe, people have been listing where they've seen a certain species, plant, animal, mushroom, fungi, insect, whatever it is, people have been logging it on this website. So we're in WAPOL. Let's just look. Can't spell. WAPOL. There we go. So I just typed in WAPOL and it just showed us everything logged in WAPOL. That's pretty cool. Maybe not super handy, but pretty cool. So how can we make this more interesting? Well, let's go to species. Actually, let's go to filters. And let's just look at the bird species that have been seen in WAPL. Then we can go to species to almost 150 species seen here. And you can look at what species have been seen in WAPL and if you click on one, it will tell you where somewhere on here. Yeah, this is a, a northern flicker. And then you can, you know, also go back to here and be like, all right, I live over here. Who, who knows? What, what was seen here? A turkey. You know, that's maybe something a lot of you have seen, but you can go through and find where that Baltimore Oriole was seen. And you can, it gives you a date that it was seen. Um, it gives you a location. It's really hard to use a computer at this angle. Here we go. So uh, woodpeckers were seen over here in 2019. There's definitely newer ones. I just happen to keep clicking on the old ones. A red-tailed hawk was seen nesting here. So maybe if you want to go see the red-tailed hawk, you could find this location. So, and you know, there's other ones too. I just picked birds because obviously I really like birds. But maybe you very specifically are just curious in amphibians. Is that what I selected? Yeah, that's a frog. And you can find places where there are frog colonies or frog populations to go hear them or to find them, to see them, whatever. I just like to share this website so that you guys can get a good idea of how it might be useful to you. You can also, let's say we, we'll just, we're just going to put Massachusetts in and let's say you're really interested in seeing a river otter. Like you just have this real hankering to go see a river otter. You can use this. I promise you can. It's just. I don't know why it's breaking down now. We're just going to reset it. I naturalist. So literally like the letter I'm. Oh, it's because I still have the filter for frogs. There we go. <laughs> all right. So now you can see all the locations that river otters have been
cataloged in Massachusetts. Obviously, there's, you know, people have seen them other places, but somewhere in this area is the Stony Brook Wildlife Sanctuary where there are otters, which isn't too far away from you guys. Can't guarantee you'll go see one there, but if that's something you're curious about and you're like, I'm just really feeling seeing an otter today, you can use this to try to go find one. No promises, but this is just a really good tool to use if you guys are interested in going out and seeing more wildlife or seeing what's been logged or just exploring and playing with it and learning different things. Does anyone have questions about this? No? Okay, cool. Um, so that is where I got the data that we just talked about here. Um, and just showing you how many species and how easy it is to go out into nature and look at things. Um, and that's what I really want to bring home today. Like you don't have to go far to see something cool. That being said, of course, what animals are going to live in cities and what animals are you less likely to see? The way biologists divide animals is in these big general categories. Um, and we're just going to talk about the big general categories. We can start narrowing down, but that's like a whole university lecture. And we have things to do today, I'm sure. So they divide them into generalists and specialists. Generalists are species that can adapt to all sorts of different habitats, like the raccoon. The raccoon might live in the forest and never come out of the forest. They might be happy in the woods with tons of acres around them, no people. They're going to survive pretty well. They also can survive in your backyard and eat Doritos. They're pretty flexible in that regards. Other species like monarch butterflies are specialist species. They can't just switch to eating Doritos. They need specific types of milkweed. And then to travel down south to Mexico, they need goldenrod, specifically seaside goldenrod, to eat on the way down. They're not super flexible in changing that behavior. They can't readapt to something new. At least they haven't yet and we haven't seen and we don't expect it to. So that's kind of how we divide these into big general terms. We have the generalist species, graded adaption, and specialist, not so graded adaption. So let's talk about pigeons. The rats of the sky. Uh, pigeons, shockingly, are one of the most intelligent bird species in the world which I always get a little really, but like, remember these guys used to carry mail, you know, passenger pigeons. Pigeons are shown. There's all sorts of like these beautiful pigeon species. They're actually highly intelligent. Um, and they're herbivores. And before they overtook cities, they lived on the cliff faces um, of North Africa. Actually, that's where they evolved. So they evolved to live on tall, sharp, steep cliffs. What looks like a tall, sharp, steep cliff? skyscrapers. So they basically saw, you know, okay, habitats are being destroyed. People, human beings are moving in. Maybe there's a lack of food, whatever it is. And they adapted to switch from their native homeland, I guess, and started migrating to cities. And they're pretty much widespread around the world now because they can adapt so easily. They don't require specific temperatures. I mean, they can't live in like freezing cold weather or complete boiling heat, but they're everywhere. They're all across the U.S. And they are herbivores, but they'll also eat now breadcrumb, breadcrumbs, popcorn, biscuits, chips, pasta, fish, a Mc, McDonald's burger. What are they called? Big Macs. <laughs> They'll eat anything. They've adapted really, really well. Um, and one of the ways that they've adapted so well is uh, you never see baby pigeons because the babies will stay with their mother till they're basically almost full grown. Um, so they're all up in the nest. They never come down until they're full grown. They've adapted special like milky glands to feed their young. So they go down, get food, redigest it like most birds, but they have like an, a special gravelly milky substance that breaks down a lot of the food so they can feed it to their young. Highly, highly adaptable. Um, pigeons are so smart because they pass also what's called the mirror test. If you've ever put your dog in front of a mirror and gone, look, it's you. And they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. You crazy person. Um, pigeons not only like see something in the mirror, they recognize it as them. 
Um, so that's a whole test that we use to like as a mark of intelligence. Um, so pigeons can learn commands, all sorts of things. And they're all over your backyard and they're weird little birds if you watch them closely. Now, right along with pigeons is the peregrine falcon, the fastest animal on the planet, 200 miles an hour dives. Um, and they adapted right along with the pigeons. Why? Pigeons are their main source of food. So peregrine falcons are also all over the world. They're one of those species that lives all across the globe, not necessarily just in one space or another. They're everywhere too because their favorite snack is pigeons, you know, fat little round pigeons. So these guys are really common to see in cities too because they will nest up tall on the, the skyscrapers, dive down, catch a pigeon and come back up. They'll feast on other birds as well, but I figure a pigeon's probably really easy to catch. Um, and they will snack on other urban wildlife as well. Rats, mice, other small things um, they will catch. So there are peregrine falcons in Boston. This is, in fact, a picture of all these pictures are from Boston themselves. These two are, I think, on the university. I think one is on Tufts University. I think it's like outside of a professor's office. They are there. You can go see peregrine falcons. And they're beautiful birds. They're absolutely stunning. And they're the fastest animal on the planet. And they're right there in Boston because they like the fat little pigeons. So another generalist, easy, able to adapt to different environments. We, of course, have the eastern cottontails. I'm sure you've all seen bunnies. Um, these species have well adapted to human environments as well, but these guys haven't really changed their eating habits. You know, they still are herbivores. They eat grass, they eat dandelions. They haven't started eating trash or anything like that. So they've adapted to life in the suburbs and the cities, but they haven't actually changed diet or anything like that. They are still extremely skittish. It is pretty rare that you're gonna approach a bunny and it's not gonna immediately run away. Squirrels still do that. Bunnies are more like, quick fleeing, high um, prey drive and et cetera, or predator drive. But they have learned to start snacking on things like vines and hedges over the grasses that maybe you'd find in a more rural space. So they've basically been able to move into cities because food is plentiful, especially in suburban places. Grasses, dandelions, they love dandelions. Great like snack for them. So they've been able to follow and move in there. Along with foxes. Foxes eat bunnies. <laughs> so they're going to follow what they eat as well. These guys will also eat Big Macs um, and other trash items. But they are also following um, mice, birds, invertebrates, berries, your leftovers, pizza, whatever. They're following it into the cities as well. And a lot of foxes live under people's sheds. And they might never know. They're very quiet. They'll slink around. Um, they're probably, they're not going to approach you. They don't want to be near you. Um, but these guys are pretty common sight to see in these areas as well. Now I want to talk a little bit, we've been, I've been saying the word adapt. I've been talking about these animals that are like quickly able to adapt in these different scenarios. And I want to talk briefly about that, what that means. So this is, um, an old lizard. We don't have them in Boston. It's too cold. These guys are in Puerto Rico. Um, and they have these weird, funky little feet. So they kind of have like ridges on their feet that allow them to climb up horizontally. You know, you might see if you, if you travel to an area with lizards, they'll like hang upside down on the walls or like run up a window. No problem. Um, and they do that because they have these weird, specially adapted toes that are basically like cling that they'll cling to a surface. Now, here's the difference, though. This is the same species of lizard, same DNA. But a group of them have stayed in the forest, and another group of them have, have moved into, like, San Juan, like the city spaces. Same exact species, um, but they've lived for several generations in these different environments. The forest lizards we've seen have smaller toes while the ones that are in the urban spaces have bigger toes and they're wider, okay? So that's just one thing that you've noticed. Why? So this is a video of the forest lizard. 
Now, it looks like we're looking down at something. This is actually like against a wall, completely like vertical, like vertical. Like it is, we're actually looking at like this angle. It's just turned because of the way the camera was. Um, so this is a 90 degree angle and we're gonna watch the forest lizard walk up these tiles. So there he is. He struggles a little bit, but he makes it, right? He goes. Now let's look at the lizard that has adapted, um, that has had several generations of being in the city. I've got to plug the computer in too. Yeah, really fast. He doesn't hesitate at all. He just like zooms right up um, the the side of the building. And that's just because his toes have adapted over however many generations it took of these lizards living in the city. They adapted to be able, their toes got wider, longer, and these species basically evolved to be able to walk up tile. I would have loved to see the reverse if they'd taken trees, like tree bark, um, but they didn't have that video. They only had this one. I so that's what we're looking at, and that's kind of what we're talking about when we're talking about adaptations. Um, and this is also a global phenomenon, so we're not just seeing these like birds like peregrine falcons moving into urban spaces following the pigeons or the foxes following food. Um, these are coyotes in Chicago. I mostly picked Chicago because I thought this picture is hysterical. Um, he's on the train, and he regularly rides the train. This isn't a weird occurrence. This coyote has learned the pat, like the train schedule, and he rides in and out of the train to different locations. So these guys have highly adapted. They even recognize the red versus green when crossing the street. They've become very good at living in the city. Worldwide, um, we have this jaguar hanging out in... Um, is it Mumbai, leopard, just, just hanging out in somebody's backyard. Not good. You don't want that. But their habitat's being destroyed, and they're having to find food somewhere else. Uh, wild boars, I believe this is Germany. Um, yeah, um, this is a, just a look in Germany of he's walking to work there's a city to his to the side of the picture we can't see and there's just boars you know sharing the same pathway with him um timber wolf timber wolves blah, um have been sighted along roadways in paris just on the side of the road in paris and then these guys are smooth coated otters in singapore um, who've moved on to the edges of cities because their habitat's been destroyed and they're looking for food so they've, they've started moving into places like resorts and things, looking for food that people might give them. So this is not just, you know, happening because the pigeons have adapted to the skyscrapers and the peregrine falcon follows the pi pigeon or the bunny. And the, this is also happening because habitats are being destroyed and they don't have anywhere else to go. And this is kind of like a make or break it. If they can survive in the city, maybe they'll be able to stay. But unlikely because people don't want leopards in their backyard or timber wolves in Paris. So, and then there are a lot of species who absolutely just can't even try. They cannot adapt to cities because cities have some of the biggest dangers to wildlife anywhere. They have tons of pollution, air pollution. I didn't put it here, but water pollution in cities is a huge problem. Um, light pollution. So at night, there's so many lights. Um, it confuses a lot of the animals because a lot of animals navigate by sun or stars. Um, turtles will go the wrong direction on beaches because the way turtles, when turtles hatch, um, they go to the ocean, right? And the reason they know to go to the ocean is because moon and stars reflects off the water. So if it was pitch black, you'd be able to figure out which side was the water because there'd be some light reflected from stars and moons and whatever. But when the beaches are next to a city, they can't, they don't know which way to go. They follow the light. So wrong direction. Um, habitat fragmentation, that is this idea that habitats are broken up by, by buildings or urban spaces or even just uh, cutting 
cutting forests down that separate, you know, the forest over here from the forest over there. And some animals are not willing to cross that distance. A lot of birds uh, can't deal with like bright light actually. So some birds will stay in a forest area and never go into like an open meadow or anything like that because they won't be able to see. So habitat fragmentation divides up. So certain animals just can't live in this space. And then, of course, traffic is dangerous, but also anthropogenic noise, so human-generated noise, such as, you know, traffic in general, large stadiums, concert. That's a lot of noise for some animals, and it can either frighten them or it can actually, like, hurt their hearing. So there's some animals that just cannot adapt to city life. And we talked briefly about the monarch butterfly. I'm sure you guys have seen monarch butterflies in your backyard in urban spaces. So to clarify, this guy is a specialist, but that doesn't mean he's not here or that you might not see him. It just means that if you don't have the certain properties, he's not going to come or he's going to have a harder time surviving if you don't have the milkweed. And if we lose a bunch of the goldenrod that goes along the uh, coast, because that's how they survive. But other animals that we might want to see such as this musk turtle. I love him. I think he's very weird looking. These guys will not come to urban spaces at all because they cannot deal with polluted waterways. So if water has any type of pollutants, these guys can't survive. They need clear water. So there's no way that they're going to survive well in an urban space. You might see one because they have nowhere else to go, but these guys have a really hard time. So these guys can't adapt very well to city spaces. And it's going to be very unlikely that you're going to see these guys. They're th I believe they're listed as threatened in Canada, but they might be endangered. I'm not sure. They're definitely a species of, of concern. Sawwit owls are another specialist species. This is the smallest owl that we have here in New England. Have any of you seen one? Yeah, I didn't think so. <laughs> Unless he's out in captivity. These guys are super hard to spot. They blend in very well. They're really tiny um, and their movements are short and they fly silently. So they're really hard to see. And they um, feed on mice that live in the forest, voles, shrews, maybe young squirrels, but they don't adapt well to city life because of all the reasons previously stated. They um, need the quiet. They need it to be really dark so they, they can see and hunt. They um, eat insects and mostly animals that they catch in the woods. So they have a really hard time adapting to city spaces and you're not going to find one um, really hanging out just in the open. You might see one in your backyard. I never have. I don't think I know anyone who ever had. The only times I've seen these guys in the wild is when we've gone uh, catching them for, for bird banding. They are very elusive and you're not going to see them except one was spotted right near Salem University. This is like a random one time he was spotted sitting in a tree by Salem University. So you can find these guys. This is, you know, using iNaturalist. I was like, where have these guys been spotted? And I was like, that's weird. One's been spotted in Salem. How random. That's a pretty populated area. It might have gotten lost. Wind, storms, whatever could have blown it off. My boss swears he saw one at Fenway. I don't know if I believe him, <laughs> but I'm sure he did. I mean, it's very possible. You can see all sorts of things if you're paying attention in urban spaces, but these guys are a lot less likely to be spotted. Like if you're going to go to Boston and look for big birds, you're going to be looking for that peregrine falcon. You're going to be looking for those bald eagles, owls. You might be looking for a great horned owl. They're, they're seen at Mount Auburn Cemetery and small owls. You might see a screech owl. Screech owls are in your backyards. I guarantee that you have been within 100 feet of a screech owl, maybe even 50 feet. They're everywhere, but they are so small and they're so hard to spot. I've never seen one in the wild, but they estimate there's a lot more in Massachusetts than we think because they're just so tiny and so they blend in ridiculously well that you never see them, but they are there. So switching gears a little bit, let's talk about where you guys can see wildlife in this region, in this area without having to go too far. There's the Ames uh, Noel State Park. Um, people have seen a lot of cool ducks here, not just mallards, eiders and um, buffleheads and all sorts of fun things there, along with some incredible warblers in the spring, beautiful, beautiful songs. 
um, here at DW Field Park in Brockton, apparently in an incredible birding space. You can see a ton of birds there. And there is a path that goes all the way around the river but, or the lake, and a lot of people don't know about it. But it's, you know, in Brockton, not too far. And you can see a ton of wildlife there. Um, Wampatuck State Park as well. This is more likely you might even see some snakes and amphibians here. I heard someone go, no snakes. Trust me, they're a lot cooler than you think. <laughs> but I understand. Yeah, yeah. But like they have a different type of habitat, more like pine forest habitat. So you can see a whole bunch of other different things here. Throughout Massachusetts, this is just a list of all the, the um, conservation spaces and the sanctuaries that Mass Audubon um, has. So all the yellow are sanctuaries. Yes. The yellow are sanctuaries and the blue are just conservation spaces. <clears throat> you can find this on our website. Um, but there's, you know, look at the, the, there's a lot of dots in our region. I mean, Metro South alone, we have, um, a sanctuary in Milton at, um, the Blue Hills Trailside Museum. We have the Museum of the American Bird Art in Canton. We have Stony Brook Wildlife Sanctuary, not too far from here in Norfolk. And we have Moose Hill in Sharon um, as well that has lots, of, which is the first Mass Audubon Sanctuary actually, and has these amazing trails. And you can even just sit outside um, and watch the birds come to the feeders. And we get a ton of cool birds that you might not expect um, there as well. More I mentioned it earlier, but Mount Auburn Cemetery, excellent for birding. I don't know what it is about cemeteries. Birds love cemeteries. They love cemeteries because wide open spaces, lots of insects, relatively quiet, and not as many predators. Um, Mount Auburn Cemetery, you know, I mentioned great horn owls. This was seen this past um, fall, I think in like September, the owl in the corner. This is a Baltimore Oriole, and this is just a nest in one of the... Um, statues that hangs around there great birding spot <laughs> if you want to go see some wildlife the cape also you can go see a ton of birds down at the cape i know that one's a little further i'm stretching a little bit here but especially in the winter and you're like the cape in the winter that's freezing you're not wrong it is freezing but you can see the coolest ducks in the winter down on the Cape. These crazy colorful Harlequin ducks that come all the way from Canada and Alaska that only sit on the waves of the surf because these birds are born next to rapid water rivers. And so the chicks learn to survive the rapid waters. They like live on rapid water streams. And so when they come to Massachusetts for the winter, because it's warmer here than it is up in Canada, they sit on the surf of the ocean and they just ride the waves. There's these big birds, uh, beautiful bird called eiders and scoters and hooded mergansers that have these weird like feathers that make a crazy hood. There's all sorts of these weird ducks that you can see. You don't have to go to the Cape. You can, um, there's some o over at Stony Brook, just not as many. You're not gonna see the ones that ride the waves at Stony Brook, but there's all sorts of cool ducks. Use that eye naturalist. If you're like, I wanna see some weird looking ducks, you'll see some weird looking ducks. They're really cool. And then I just briefly, and I'm gonna show a couple of videos here, um, wanna talk about how this is more than just seeing the animal itself. It is super cool to see a great horned owl, but it's more cool to actually watch it for a little bit than going, ah, yes, check, and then walking away. Behavior of wildlife is one of the coolest and most fascinating parts of being a birder or loving wildlife or even just loving animals. You wanna watch what they're doing because they do some really cool things that you might not notice if you hadn't, you know, quickly paid attention or if you just saw the animal and were like oh wow now I've seen it and dismissed it or even I'm coming back to it pigeons <laughs> pigeons again we see these guys all the time and you guys have seen their behavior but if you watch closely they do these complex dance systems they'll dance with each other they'll share food with each other they have amazing navigational abil abilities. If you watch like a group of pigeon, they're doing the like kind of this dance amongst each other. They'll like fight amongst each other. They'll like court each other. They'll like dance for each other. All these behaviors that you can see if you watch them for a minute and start like paying attention to what they're doing. And even at our feeders, we can see some really cool behaviors. Um, hopefully this video gets less blurry once I play it, but these are a bunch of feeders here. It's like an eight second video. And we're just going to watch it once through.
This is up at Cornell. All right, so within that eight, I think it was eight seconds, in that eight second video, I saw five different behaviors. How do I make it go again? Um, I saw the birds foraging. Obviously, they're eating seeds. I saw several of the birds fighting with each other, with one winning out. I saw several birds fleeing, which is leaving the feeder. Um, and I saw some birds calling, as well as you can just see some, some hierarchy things going on here. So if I play this again, the starling scared off the dove, but the dove came back and was like, absolutely not. I'm coming back. You can't do that to me. The cardinal then comes in, sitting not too close. And then we have, if you watch down here, the red winged blackbird and the cardinal, in a moment, they're going to fight and the red winged blackbird wins. That was just looking at two of these birds. We can replay this so many times. And now let's watch this, this feeder. There's a woodpecker on the other side that we can't see yet, but he's there. And you can see all the starlings and the other birds, they're avoiding that. But then this downy woodpecker shows up and you can watch them. They're going to make sure that they stay on exact opposite sides the whole time. They're not going to feed next to each other. The one, the red bellied, which is the one with the red head because scientists don't know how to name things, um, is bigger than that downy woodpecker or hairy woodpecker. I didn't pay too much attention. So the downy's going to respect him and move around in circles. In the winter, these birds form uh, mixed foraging flocks where there can be one bird that's like the alarm call bird, usually a tufted titmouse or a black capped chickadee. They're going to watch over everything. And if they see a threat, they're going to release this call. Um, that's going to warn all the other birds in the area to flee. So there's cooperative things. There's fighting things there do. There are hierarchy. And if you watch them for a little bit, even just something at the feeder, you're going to learn a little bit about like the types of birds um, and kind of their attitudes. Cardinals are mean. <laughs> they also know how to bite you right on your like cuticles. Like, I don't know how they know, but they do know. I worked at a little wildlife rehab for a while. And you'll watch cardinals have like these different structures than some of the other birds and how they act versus the chickadees who might, we will all go together, grab a seed and leave, or the woodpeckers who will stay there for a while. All sorts of behaviors you can watch just watching your feeder. Let's talk about squirrels for a minute because that's another animal I'm sure you see all the time. They also have some weird behaviors. So this is a video from the BBC and hopefully we'll be able to hear it. I can also just tell you guys what's going on. Oh, it didn't work. Okay, let's see. Why are we not playing? Okay, here we go. The crook may still be watching, but this is what he wants. In a shameless display of overacting, he pretends to bury his nut. So this squirrel's pretending to bury a nut? The thief waits until the performance is over. This is another squirrel who's watching him. So he's trying to steal it, but the other guy faked him out by not actually putting anything there. <laughs> so this is a robotic squirrel they created just for this. And our little thief is going to steal it right out of her hands. Theft is such an easy option. Around a fifth of all squirrels. And the nut has a camera in it, which is what we're watching now. But 
This time, the thief has picked the wrong nut. <laughs> That's hysterical, right? <laughs> and that's what I mean. Like, we see these animals all the time. But if you just take a second to, like, watch what they're doing a little, like, closer, you might notice some really funny things. As I mentioned, I was at the commons the other day, and the fattest squirrels are at the common right now, guys. I mean, they are round. They are rotund. Um, and I watched them for a little bit, and they were all doing this. They were stealing things from each other, stealing them back, running around. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Let's, we're going to talk about that in one min minute. But yes, to attract different animals, you need different things, um, which I'm actually going to talk about in a second. And we can talk a little bit more in detail about that specific question as well. Um, real quick, I just wanted to once again mention that there are some really helpful uh, websites and apps and tools that you can you can use to, to learn on your own. I, w I would love for you guys to leave here being like, there's, I want to go explore more or pay more attention. Um, just observe, write things down on your own. And, um, one of the ways that you can do that is of course, iNaturalist as we talked about, but there's two other apps. These are on your phone. Um, that you can use. The first one is called the Merlin bird ID. Um, and it walks you through how to identify a bird. It starts off by being like, where are you? How big was the bird you saw? What colors was the bird? And then it gives you a list of possibilities of what the bird might be. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. And they just added this feature that I would have loved when I was in college, where you just press the button and hold it up and it identifies the bird singing. That's crazy to me. Like <laughs> I, I just like, had to memorize all those. So it's a great little tool that you can use to just learn about what's in your area, bird, bird wise. The other app is called Seek, Seek by iNaturalist. So it's made by the same company as iNaturalist, but it's called Seek. This one is um, an app that gives you a camera on your phone. So it opens up as a camera and you can take a picture of something and it's going to help you ID it. Um, as we, if we, if you come with me on the walk, we'll try to use it out there. It's not as great in the winter because it's hard to identify trees and plants without leaves, but it can do more than just plants and trees. It can do insects. It can do birds. It can do mammals. It can do fish. Um, you just need to upload a picture. So even if you don't take the picture with the app, you can upload the picture to the app and it will help you identify it. And if the app can't identify it, you can post it and someone on the online community will comment back and help you figure out what it is. So there's a huge community for these things that you, you can get to explore. Um, but to, to finish up today, um, let's talk about some things you can do in your own backyard or in your own life to help support wildlife in these urban spaces. Uh, the first one is of course, bird feeders. If you're interested in birds, the question about attracting different birds to your yard. Absolutely. If you want to attract, um, songbirds you can get the regular songbird seed that you see at a store it's like the small pellets um maybe a mix if you want to attract birds like cardinals and blue jays get yourself some sunflower seeds and just fill one with sunflowers if you want woodpeckers suet so those those cake blocks of suet um or mealworms you can buy dried mealworms sprinkle them in bluebirds love mealworms so sprinkling some um, of the dried mealworms into your feeder is might attract some mealworms and then if you want uh frugivore birds so birds that eat fruit like our baltimore oriole they have specially designed feeders like this one where you stick an orange and then you stick some jam around the edges and the the baltimore orioles or any other bird that eats fruit is going to be attracted to that over something that has seeds in it um, so you can try all these things i will tell you that birds don't have a sense of smell so it's going to take them a while to figure out if there's a feeder there or not so if you put a feeder up and you're not getting anything but the little brown birds the house sparrows which are actually invasive um, just give it some time, change the food. If you have a squirrel problem, two suggestions. The first one is get one of those like squirrel springs. The second one is put chili powder in your seed. Birds can't taste chili powder because they don't have a sense of taste, but the squirrels will immediately be, you know, off put by the taste. I've never done that one. I usually just get the feeders that spring so that the squirrels can't actually get into it. But depending how aggressive your problem is, 
there are different methods as well. Um, or you can get a squirrel feeder, which are my favorite. It's like this, li it looks like a little picnic table that you like, hang on a tree and then you put a corn cob on it and the squirrels love it. Um, other things you can do is plant native plants. That's the simplest thing you can do to attract wildlife to your yard. Native flowers, native grasses um, can easily attract birds, um, butterflies, hummingbirds, native bees um, to your yard without you doing anything but just making sure you have those plants there. I mentioned milkweed earlier. Don't, don't, don't plant milkweed or goldenrod in your yard, guys. <laughs> it will take over everything. <laughs> but if you really want to attract monarch butterflies, you could get, put, put them in their own pot or something like that separate um, and make sure that you take them away before the seeds um, pop up in the fall. But that you could try to attract monarchs with that or goldenrod again. Goldenrod will also take over everything, though. And bats. Bats are great at uh, controlling mosquitoes and all those little insects that bug us when we're outside. So putting up simple, like a bat house, you can buy them online, you can make them, um, will attract bats to your yard. Maybe it might take a couple years for them to show up or they might come right away, but they're great insect control right there built in. To see other cool things, maybe not in your backyard, but in the area, you should find a place that has a vernal pool. Vernal pools are um, shallow areas um, in the ground that fill up with water in the spring, but the rest of the year they're dry. These are where salamanders and frogs um, will lay their eggs. It's also where owls will come to hunt for salamanders and frogs. Barred owls um, love frogs, so they'll hang around a vernal pool. Other animals will also come to a vernal pool. Wood ducks, um, mallards, other small uh, opossums and things like that. So find a place that has a vernal pool and just, you know, wander through it in the spring. You might see something really cool. Um, leaving leaf litter in a space can also be really beneficial or going somewhere like a forest that has a lot of leaf litter. Leaf litter protects a lot of wildlife. So under the leaf litter is where Luna moth eggs will be. So those big, beautiful green moths, they will lay their eggs under the leaf litter. Box turtles will burrow down under leaf litter to stay warm during the winter. Lots of animals burrow deep underground and under the leaf litter um, to survive. So leaving leaf litter is really important um, to help support wildlife. Obviously, you got to rake up some of it if you need to, depending where you are. But if you have the, a, a possibility to leave some places, it's great for wildlife. Um, again, bird, bird seed feeders, I put that one there. Um, if you're really interested in just knowing what's going on, you can put up your own ca uh, trail camera lock it, it will get stolen. Or you can do the simple thing and go online. Uh, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology has a ton of uh, live cameras. Place it at different places around the world. Those ones are just birds, but I know that there's other places with trail cameras that you can go online and just watch the trail cameras and see some really crazy things um, in our area or around the world. And then, of course, composting really helps support a lot of insect life. It supports butterflies. It also just supports uh, wildlife in general. Things to avoid if you want to attract animals to your backyard are feeding the animals directly. So obviously, bird feeders, things like that is fine. Definitely try not to feed any animals things that you from your table. Treat them like a dog. They're not supposed to get up food scraps, but be serious about it, unlike I am with my dog. Um, don't feed them from hand because then they'll become too dependent on humans and won't be able to adapt to, to survive in the wild if you moved or something like that happened or if they stopped getting that food source. Um, if you have pets or cats, um, indoor is always better for cats, but that's not always possible. Um, but you can buy these silly little clown collars if they go outside um, that are bright and colorful that warns wildlife that there's a cat there. And also simply putting a bell on your cat can warn the animals of them coming um, into the area. And one really highly strong thing to do to protect wildlife is try to avoid insecticides and pesticides, spraying big, big amounts of that um, in your, your yard. So that is my talk for today. Um, hopefully you learned a little bit about where you can see wildlife in your region, about animals that might be here and might not be here, and some ways that you can go find them and attract them to your own yard. Um, we can do some questions if anyone has one, and we'll get ready to go 
on our walk. Thanks, guys. Yes. Probably squirrels or mice. Ooh, that sucks. Where is in this area here in Wapple? Norwood. Um, I, it's happened to quite a few people, and unfortunately, there's not too much you can do, um, except. You know, if it's mice, they're going to be moving in there because it's cold and they're looking for a place to stay for the winter. Um, if it's squirrels and something like that, they're doing the same thing. You can even I've seen like uh, animals build nests inside car engines. Honestly, the first thing you can do is if you do have a garage, park it in the garage. I don't have a garage. I can't do that. But just make sure you're starting your car at least once a day. Make sure you're going out to your car simple things like slamming doors of your car, moving around it, knocking on the hood is just going to scare things away. Very simple to try that. And if that's not working, you have an aggressive squirrel or mice problem. And you might need to do something like if it's, if you're parked right outside your house and something, those mice are living underneath your house. Um, and there's various non-poisoning methods of removing them, but that's something you'd call an exterminator about if it's like an aggressive, aggressive problem. Um, but but I would suggest really making sure you're starting your car, opening and shutting all the doors at least once a day, if not more, just to, to make it not a fun home to live in. Yes? Uh, what about them? <laughs> Yeah. Mhm. Mm but the they, they require a very clean field. Yes. Back, you know, uh, they, well, they they there are reasons, you know, some some years my parents have a 60 acre sheep farm up in New Hampshire and for years and years we always got like these certain types of birds and suddenly they stopped coming. And sometimes you can't determine the reason for that. Um, but if you've no regularly gotten hummingbirds and they're, they're not coming, it might've honestly been a bad year. It can be something as simple as that. Um, but the feeders that are great for hummingbirds are, you know, the hanging ones that with the, um, little holes. Um, and if you're making a feed for them, um, I don't know if you make it yourself, if you buy it, it's a lot better to make it yourself and you should avoid the stuff that's dyed red actually. So when you like look for hummingbird, f like food in the stores, it's dyed red for no apparent reason. You don't need to do that. The other thing you can do is, um, simply plant or get pots of, um, uh, flowers that, uh, nectivores eat. Yeah. So it might've just been a bad year that happens. That's a bummer. <laughs> um, yeah, I have a lot of feelings about that. But from an ecological standpoint, um, actually culling species is not a bad idea. Deer hunting is a good thing in general because overpopulation of a species can actually be detrimental to the wildlife. So um, fish and wildlife, you know, allow in certain times of year in certain spaces deer hunting on their properties because the forest just can't sustain uh, so many deer and they don't have a lot of predators um because while coyotes are a predator they're actually pretty tiny um and they are not going to take down a full-grown deer so unless they have a big like that's not something they're going to do so in general you know, I'm not necessarily against uh, limiting a population. That being said, coyotes are very unlikely to go after a person. Um, and the way we scared them off on the farm was we lit off a firework. You can just be loud. They're, they're not, 
you know, they're, they're afraid of people in general, unless someone's been feeding them. Um, they're, they're afraid of people and, you know, a lot easier, um, is something like that. But I don't know enough about the situation there to really say the reason or not. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not so sure about that one. I think I'd need to read up about more about what the actual issue is in the town with the coyotes specifically. Yes. Hmm. That does happen. I guess they just didn't nest near you. They must have nested somewhere else. Yeah, they're weird. They're weird. They they migrate all the way to Mexico and then come all the way back up. And it's always possible that they're just going to pick a new location to nest. Weather-wise, we had a hot summer, like a really hot summer. And that can affect where they're nesting, um, where they're picking locations, and how they're going to be acting. But you just got all the fall, fall migration. You probably got all the birds that were heading, heading back um, south. So they all stopped over at your feeder, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I, yes. Yeah. So they're not hibernating. They're conserving energy. So birds and mammals and animals that stay here during the winters, um, they're in the process of, as I call it, getting chunky. So they spend the fall like storing up fat and storing up reserves um, and eating and eating. Like birds will go crazy for fruit, high sugar um, in the fall because that's just a, like that store as well. And that does. So birds are not also just in general, birds aren't going to be singing in the winter because they sing to attract mates. They're not breeding in the winter for the most part. Um, they're not really doing those activities. They're not flying around to take care of babies or anything like that. So they just, all they have to do in the winter is eat and stay alive. So they might, you know, bunker down for several hours of the day before finding food, um, but they're not hibernating. They're just a lot more silent in the winter. Yes. I have a squirrel that comes and is looking in my window. He likes you. <laughs> just looks in the window. He might be seeing his reflection and checking it out. I have a squirrel. My cat is best friends with a squirrel. She's not allowed outside, but the squirrel comes up to the windowsill and um, my cat goes to the window and they just look at each other through the window. I don't know. I think squirrels are curious. This is why I mentioned behavior. They're just curious. Um, I mean, is it, you, you should start logging. Is it the same time of day? When, where, is the light on the window? Is the light on the window? What's going on around that time? They do curious behavioral things that we don't totally understand. Any other questions? All right, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, if you have other questions, please feel free to ask me. Um, I believe we're going on a walk. It looks really nice. So if you're hanging around for the walk, we'll just, we'll just start in here and I will find out where we're going to start. Um, otherwise, thank you so much for coming. Um, if you'd like my card or any other information, um, I have that for you. Uh, if you go on to the Mass Audubon website and look at programs for adults in the Metro South, this December we are offering two art programs. Uh, next week we are making flower presses at the Museum of American Bird Art, and you can sign up to make those. And we have a live animal drawing course, um, I believe. Yeah, also next Thursday. Thursday night. So we're doing some art classes starting in the new year. We're going to have a talk series. So talk something like this, a little bit more focused, ecological. We're going to talk about the secret life of winter birds. So a lot about how they survive winter. Um, we're going to talk about, uh, what, what did, what we call it? Um, we're going to talk about birds and, and mating. Like, are they monogamous? Are they 
poly, do they cheat on each other? So that's going to be a talk we're going to do in February. Um, we'll talk about amphibians. So that's going to be a, a talk series that we'll do um, in the evenings throughout the spring. Uh, BYOB, at the mu again, at the Museum of American Bird Art in Canton, not too far away from here, along with intro to birding classes and a lot of other um, activities. So keep a lookout on the Mass Audubon website, or you can always grab my card or take my email and ask me and I can add you to our email listing. Thank you everyone. Um, it was lovely to speak to you today.